All right. Uh, <laughs> oh, this mic's getting hot, man. It's getting what? Hot. It's getting hot. It's a hot mic. Uh, <laughs> it's weird, right? It feels like somebody's talking like right into your ear. I know. It's a little bit uh, bizarre. I have to adjust my microphone here a little bit. Hey, there we go. Uh, Dad. Uh, on this episode of the Madness Continues podcast, I'm interviewing uh, Mike, Mike Lemon. <laughs> the man, the myth, <laughs> the mayhem. <laughs> This is uh this is my this is my dad and I'm interviewing him. He retired yesterday. He's one day into retirement. Man, it's never felt better. <laughs> 24 hours into it, I'm a new man. <laughs> <laughs> well, like you so it was a good event. It's, let's let's talk about that first is that. Yes. So this is this is the Madness Continues podcast and normally I interview People like uh, I have I've had philosophers on here. I've had a, a couple of economists on here. Uh, other comedians, of course, some actors. And, and this is people. the first time you're having someone with an IQ less than maybe a carrot. <laughs> 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 oh man, Dad, <laughs> you got you got that nap in today, and you're ready to make this happen. <laughs> Yes, against my will. I want people to notice that I've been tied up and I've been tortured into this. <laughs> <laughs> you did not, You did not want to do this. I feel like. <laughs> I feel you. You really didn't want to. You were kind of like. Uh, I don't want to say you were like against it, but it didn't really feel like you were very. Enthu- you were not thrilled about. You were like, I'm going to go sit down and talk, talk to my son <laughs> for an hour. Uh, <laughs> I haven't had to do that since you were in high school. <laughs> Oh man. Uh well so de- you know so the idea I had for this podcast and so everybody listening to it uh all eight of you. Uh my dad has had a colorful career and uh we just had the, the event last night at your retirement party where people kind of recounted your career and I thought it would I thought it would be a kind of a neat idea to to talk to to you about it and get kind of a sense for you know I, I we can talk about other things too but i was thinking like just talk about your career history and you know you've been in in the workforce for 40 what how many years well uh depending on when you start to count um you know if it was uh first professional job that would have been 1979 so 30 almost 50 years really right 79 yeah, 40 it would have been 40 years next year 40 years See, I, w- I was a math major. <laughs> so 40 years next year. If you count, you know, to get the, the working ever since I first started working, which would have been like, oh, sophomore year in high school. So you're what, 15, 16? Yeah. So, yeah, as a fry cook at a greasy spoon restaurant in downtown Northville. In Northville, Michigan. <laughs> Actually started out as a bus boy, so there's a prestigious job. And minimum wage in those days was a buck and a quarter an hour. <laughs> <laughs> that's like I can't even that's so insane to think about because just thinking about that it would you would have to work an entire week to just kinda pay for like a a a, a, a six a, like a, a twenty four pack of nice beer. <laughs> well, you know, the thing about in nineteen uh seventy two or three um you know a gallon of gas was like 25 cents you know so uh you could make a buck and a quarter an hour and you could actually do okay living at your folks house with your ratty old junky car that you drove (laughs) well and you had a shelby right or what were you driving Uh, a shelby yeah the exact opposite of a shelby i had a rundown rusted out opal gt (laughs) (laughs) Uh, the Opal's claim to fame was it was the poor man's Corvette because it kind of looked like uh, a Corvette Stingray, you know, like a like a '69 Stingray. The Opal GT was like that, except someone stuck it in a dryer too long and it shrunk. <laughs> <laughs> it had a little four-cylinder engine with a double carburetor that was impossible to tune up. <laughs> So the car never actually ran right. <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> and, and that's what I used 
to earn my buck and a quarter an hour. <laughs> and did you, what you bought, but how did you, did you buy the car or how did you get, how did you even acquire the car? Well, the car was first owned by my uncle Denny, who's my dad's brother. Yep. And he was into sports cars and at some moment in his career, he decided an Opel GT was a cool car to have, and I think shortly after buying it, he discovered that it really wasn't a cool car. To have. <laughs> and so I won't. So he was like, "Let I, me I give this to my nephew." Him. <laughs> I bought it from him, and my dad co-signed. Your grandfather co-signed on a car loan that we got from the bank downtown Northville. This is back in the day where the payments came in a payment book. Oh Actually, man, a sheet of paper that you took to the bank every month. To make your payment, and my payment was fifty dollars and twenty five cents a month. A month. <laughs> so you had to work forty hours just to pay for the car, basically. Well, and yeah, the gas. But that was once a month. So you know, I was working for a buck and a quarter an hour. Oh, 15, maybe twenty hours in a week, and I had the glorious job of. Um, working the night shift as a bus boy, like you know, on the weekends. <laughs> Um, I'd work like uh, eleven o'clock at night till seven in the morning, and, <laughs> oh, man. Uh, which was grueling. And I did it Friday night and Saturday. And night. were you, you still in high school? Yeah, and I was still in high school. And uh, except when I was playing sports, so during the sports seasons, uh, when I was playing sports in high school, I wasn't working there. So I, you know, always look forward to sports season so I could get the hell out of there. But uh, working the night shift, um, you know, so at about 2 in the morning when the bars closed down, all the drunks would show up and want to have <laughs> breakfast. Oh, man. And, uh, you know, they'd get sick and stuff, and then I'd have to clean up the messes, and it was pretty bad. And actually, one night <clears throat> while working there, um, this is one of those skills for living moments. Uh, people should pay attention to this. You, One thing you never want to do in your life is uh, take a, a mop bucket, and pour a bunch of chlorine bleach into it, and yeah. then run out of the bleach and decide that ammonia cleaner is a good mix too, and pour that into the bucket because ammonia and chlorine <laughs> react instantly, releasing a serious toxic wave of chlorine gas that when you're bending over it as you're pouring the, the ammonium into it and you inhale, you suddenly are actually almost killing yourself. <laughs> well, and so having done that, oh man, I then went, uh, you know, inhaled this gas in the back room of the restaurant full of patrons at 2 a.m. in the morning. And I went running out because I couldn't breathe. Literally, the chlorine gas filled my lungs, uh, shocked my system. <laughs> uh, I, I started drooling excessively. Oh like, my God! It was just flowing like a river. It's like mustard gas. Yes, yeah, so like mustard gas. And I went running out into the restaurant, full of patrons, uh, kind of gasping and choking and trying to tell people I couldn't breathe. And one of the waitresses, who I thought actually at the moment was going to save me, escorted me right out the front door and threw me into the bushes. <laughs> 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 so that way. <laughs> None of the patrons uh, could see you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Welcome to the working world, I feel like. Yeah. That's, so somebody that's else hilarious. took pity on me and called 911, and they showed up and hauled me to, uh, to uh, actually it was uh, St. Mary's Hospital nearby here. And I uh -huh. uh, got in there at, you know, 6 or f 7 in the morning. But the they got me hooked up to oxygen, and, and then um, they had a doctor there. And I'm not making this up unless I was hallucinating at the time. This guy was a leprechaun. <laughs> what? He was about four feet tall, red hair, uh, red beard, and had a thick Irish accent. And he had a, a buckle hat and a yeah, pot of gold he was hat, carrying with him. Black shoes with big buckles. And uh, anyway, he came in. And they were having trouble getting some of the chlorine out of my lungs, so I think I've actually had some lung damage caused by this. But he had a quick technique for that, and he had me <clears throat> sit up, inhale, and then he wanted me to exhale real hard. And as I exhaled, he pushed me forward, like almost like I was doing a sit-up. Yeah. And that expelled everything, you know. And oh, so, man. <clears throat> after that, uh, I was fine. But So uh, this is so, like, yeah, this is uh, how far into the job were you when that happened? Oh, gosh, I'd probably work there six months. <laughs> <laughs> Not even a year yet. And uh, 
And uh, so, oh, man. you know, and it was a thing of legend, too, because uh, I always had a my high school reunion a few, a few years back. And a couple of people that work there that I knew from high school uh, came up and started telling me about the story, you know, like as if I had forgotten. <laughs> <laughs> Hey, remember when you almost killed yourself yeah, at the? You were drooling like a madman there in the restaurant. We had to drag you outside, <laughs> throw you in the bushes. <laughs> oh my gosh! Anyway, uh, so it was let's see, unique. Experience. So how so, long? So what was the, what the was lesson, the... the lesson for life here? Is don't mix chlorine bleach and ammonia cleaner. <laughs> oh my god! <laughs> uh, so you. So so you worked at what rest first of all what restaurant was it there in uh Well there was a chain North. of restaurants called the Palace. Yep. And uh, trust me this was anything but regal. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, oh my god. The Palace was essentially uh, a greasy spoon type place. Um you know might be comparable not even as as nice as a yeah. Denny's, the Denny's. Yeah. So it's not even that nice. It was and the restaurant, by the way, is still there. It's not a palace anymore. It's the it's the the Dan, the Gandhi the Dandy Gander the Dandy Gander. That's it. Yeah, that's the same place, just right down on Center Street, I yeah, think, or Main yeah, Street or yeah, something. It's been there forever. Oh man! So how long so, did you work there? Well, until I got my do- job at Chatham, which, which I was a senior in high school, and got a job as a bag boy at Chatham, and a friend had told me about it that. The bag boys made two sixty five an hour <clears throat> because we are union workers, and uh, but to to get the job you had to go um, down. It wasn't in Detroit, but it was close to Detroit, like Redford, East Redford, and they had a um, a place where you signed up at the union hall. They were AFL CIO workers. Uh huh. And so it was a union job, and you got paid a whole lot more money. So by the time I left the palace, I went from, you know, a buck and a quarter to a whopping buck seventy-five an hour. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, the union job as a bag boy, you made two sixty-five an hour. So well, was- what could you? All right. So hold on a second. What could you? So we were talking about a little bit about how much gas was and and all of that. But how? What could you actually afford? Like what? What? What would that that much you? So you're working there for a while. Like what would that afford you to do, basically, when you were working at at the palace? So at the palace, you know, at a buck and a quarter an hour, and you were doing twenty hours in a week. You were making, you know, what's that? Uh, Thirty bucks a week <laughs> <laughs> ish, right? Oh my gosh! So, uh, <clears throat> or twenty five dollars, and then you'd you'd pay a couple of dollars in taxes. So, twenty hours of work, fifteen hours of work would net you about twenty bucks. <clears throat> but back in those days, you know, so twenty bucks a week, I'd make eighty dollars in a month, and occasionally I got a tip. You know, if if a waitress felt like sharing a a tip with me because I bust her table good or something. I make a little bit more, but uh-huh. uh, you know, so you could, you could make a car payment <laughs> <laughs> barely, <laughs> barely and have a couple of dollars for gas and, you know, $5 would buy you a lot of gas. So, you know, that was about it. But, uh, life improved when I made, got the union job at the, at the grocery store. And because uh, it's literally uh, more than doubling your income at yes, that point, more than doubling my income. So at two sixty five an hour and 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 I got that job uh, just before summer vacation. So <clears throat> I get to work essentially full time all summer long, 40 plus hours. And, uh, you know, two sixty five an hour, <clears throat> we considered ourselves rich. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, like more than doubling your income. And then if you're at you're at eight hundred a week. Because you're working forty hours. All oh, right, part of me, eighty a week. <laughs> <laughs> well, what would so you're you, but you, so some of the guys you worked with from Chatham, you're still friends with and showed up at at the retirement party. Yeah, yesterday. right. Yep. Yeah, exactly. Friends I've had for forty years. And and so and you lived with those guys. Uh, how long were you? You were at Chatham a while. Um. Oh, five years, maybe from seventy four to seventy nine, because in seventy nine, um, 
I left Chatham and, and started working for an environmental consulting firm, and I was kind of their field grunt. You know, I'd go yeah, out and well, let's, samples. We'll talk, let's, <coughs> let's, let's wait, because we'll get there. But yeah. I'm kind of curious, like, what you're, you had moved in, because you were living with some of these guys, as Mike Shenevert yeah, and yeah. So, uh, uh, me and, and two other guys who got to be good buddies there. Uh, both, uh, at the, uh, you know, so we all started as bag boys. And as the business picked up there and and uh, whatnot, you know, we all three got promoted to being cashier stock boys. <laughs> so at that stage, you went from two sixty five an hour. <clears throat> the minimum stock boy wage was four ten an hour. Wh- what? Yeah, no, that was crazy. <laughs> that was crazy income. What's really crazy about that is that's not much lower than the minimum wage now. Yes. <laughs> like so, that's that's got to be. So if the minimum was one twenty five. That's like making four times. So that's like making twenty to twenty five dollars an hour now. Yeah, that's probably about right. It's a good analogy. So uh, you know, so we were making that kind of money, and um, and in those days, you could buy a brand new car, and your the biggest car payment I ever heard was two hundred and fifty dollars. You know? What? That and and if you owned a real luxury car, you might pay three hundred dollars, but otherwise. So, you know, a bunch of young guys, we were 18, 19, 20, making, you know, at the time, good money. And th- and then, uh, so, to, you know, a little more about the income there. So, as a union job, you got paid time and a half for overtime, which overtime was anything past eight hours in a day, uh-huh. which happened frequently. And then... If you worked a Sunday, you got paid double time for the whole day. Oh, man. And if you worked a holiday, and there were frequently holidays, you would get triple time. What? Yeah, so, you know, we always try to sign up for every weekend and holiday we could get just because of the money. Because you, you guys were rich. <clears throat> you were loaded. Well, but this was like, so So you ended up meeting these guys. and Yeah, so, uh, well, uh, to go on. <laughs> further so we were hanging out together a lot and uh at one moment one of the guys decided that he was ready to move out of his house so he um decided to buy a trailer you know a mobile home yeah and in a brand new mobile home park over in canton you know just south of of uh, where we were working and uh and then convinced us to be his roommates and i paid a whopping Seventy-five dollars a month for rent <laughs> <laughs> for my little room, and uh, it was just you know with your mother not in earshot, it was almost like the best time of my life. <laughs> You're like I'm loaded. <laughs> yeah, you know we, we were out of the house, uh, you know at eighteen, nineteen, uh, and, and and you know having a great time. The drinking age back then was eighteen. Yeah. And we would have like kegger parties at this trailer like every other weekend. I mean, uh, at least once a month, but frequently every other weekend, particularly during the <laughs> summer. One of us would just buy a keg of beer. I invested in the galvanized tub that we would keep the keg in. Which I think we still own <laughs> yes, when I was a kid. We actually still own it. And, uh, <laughs> and they just have these kegger parties every other week. And so we became extremely popular guys at the store with oh all the coworkers <laughs> and people that we knew in the area, and including the people in the trailer park. And, uh, and just, it was a ball. <laughs> That's hilarious. This is the trailer park was not, where was, this is not too far from here, right? This is, uh, no, no, not too far. It's over in Canton on, uh, Getty's road there. So, um, it's an old park now, but it was brand new then. And this is like, gosh, 1976 you know, ish, maybe. Because yeah, you graduated in 76. Maybe 75, right? actually, is when he might have bought the trailer. So This is like, this is so <coughs> funny to me because I used to drive past that trailer park on my way to eastern Michigan yeah, right. when I lived at home. Uh, I would drive past there in college. But. So you graduated in '76, but you were going, but you went to college, or you were going to go to you. You went originally to Michigan, and then yeah, well, I was working, still working like full time, and um, you know, for my college ride, my folks said, "Well, we'll we'll pay the tuition." Well, in those days, probably still true now, the tuition is actually the cheapest component of college. 
room and board and books and everything else tally up. And so, (laughs) you know, they paid the tuition, but it kind of required that I keep working. And I was working a lot, more than I wanted to. But so, you know, I was just burned out after a couple of years of full-time college and full-time work and uh, attending the engineering school there, which really wasn't what I wanted to do. It was my dad convinced me that going to engineering school and getting a job with GM, which is where he worked. And he was a pretty high up, you know, he had a pretty high position there. So, you know. Well, he was in advertising. Yeah, so he was in advertising. And worked at Detroit Diesel, basically. Yes. And which, which was at, owned yeah, by was General GM, Motors. Yeah, it was a GM time. company. And um, anyway, he convinced me to go to engineering school, which I didn't enjoy at, at all. At any moment, and um, after two years of that, I just said, I, "I'm done doing this. I just can't continue it. It's uh, burned out from the full time work and full time school. A and B. I didn't really like what I was doing, so I didn't. I, I just um, didn't go to school. You know, um, lived with the guys at the trailer, had a ball doing that, and was off for what amounted to maybe a year." So you were at U of M for one year, though, right? Two years. Two years. Okay, yeah. got it. And commuting out to Ann Arbor, basically. For, right, yeah. And taking classes all on campus and all of that. Yeah. And, but yeah. living at home in Northville. On well, a, living at home for a while and then in the trailer after that. Got so, it. Okay, got yeah. it. So, <clears throat> um, and then, you know, so it took what amounted to about a year off. Yeah. And and uh just had a ball and, and was working at uh, at the grocery store. So why didn't you but hold on, why didn't you live on campus in 1970s in the fall of 76, let's say? Cuz cuz so University of Michigan campus in the 1970s was a pretty crazy place, right? I mean like that was kind of there was like yeah, so protests I was there, going on and, and so actually I got there in the fall of 74. Oh, you graduated in 74. Yeah. Okay, yeah, got yeah. it. So I thought I don't know why, actually, Dad. I thought yeah. you graduated in seventy. Mom graduated in seventy six. That's probably right. Okay, got yeah. it. Um, but uh, yeah, U of M campus in seventy four. This is right after the late sixties, early seventies was still a wild place. You know, there was demonstrations happening on the main diag and main campus, and all my classes were in East and West Engineering mostly. And so I <clears throat> cut across the diag from where I parked in, in the 10 classes. And there was always some kind of demonstration going on. Mm. There was always a whole lot of pot smoking going on. Yeah. And then I remember the first time I encountered Hash Bash, April 1, going to class. <laughs> and uh, and okay. had no idea about it. That's, you know, young and naive. I didn't know what's going on. And I remember walking across the diagonal, and I'm like, man, there is a lot of people smoking pot out here. (laughs) (laughs) I don't know what's going on, but it's like more than normal. (laughs) So this is for all my listeners in Kingston, Jamaica, and the Russian Federation. Uh, Hash Bash is an annual event in Ann Arbor, Michigan, in which everybody just goes and smokes pot outside. That's yes, the yeah. whole point. And the purpose was, you know, they were really uh, against the marijuana laws and, and the laws against hashish and all that stuff. And Ann Arbor has been pretty progressive. Actually, at one point, they had uh, reduced um, pot possession. If you if you only had in your possession an ounce or less, it was... Um, uh, merely a, a misdemeanor. Yeah. And um, so, you know, they could issue you a ticket and it was a $50 fine or something. It was not a big deal. And, and uh, I think things have changed there since. Yeah, maybe. A little more conservative now than they used to be, but it was a unique time to be there. But anyway, the story is, you know, I just got tired of that. So I, I worked, went back to just working full time at the grocery store for about a year. But, you know, after about a year of, you know, constantly having a fun time with my buddies. And, uh, you know, we played, gotten all a whole bunch of softball leagues and bowling leagues and all these things you do <laughs> when you're, you know, this is way before, by the way, obviously cell phones and video the internet. games yeah. and the internet. Uh, yeah, I mean, none of that, none of those distractions exist. Because that's how you, you would have to meet new people. You would have to join yeah, a bowling league so, or some exactly. kind of league. To be social. You had to get into all these kind of things, you know, bowling leagues, softball leagues, you know, if you played tennis, tennis stuff, you know, whatever. 
church organizations. I mean, that's how you met other people. And uh, that's course, so this weird. Is, this is during the height of the disco era. This so. is so this is so <laughs> weird for me to even imagine, though, because that's that's so bizarre that that's how people meet. Because people, I mean, you can do that today also, I mean, I guess, but like nobody, you know what I mean? Like yeah, if you, right. you would meet yeah. people through online groups like meetup.com or Tinder right. or whatever. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, exactly. That's how you met people was, uh, and you just had to be kind of forward if you wanted to meet girls. And the best way to meet girls was to go to the disco bars or dancing bars or wherever. And uh, that's how you met people, so. Um, and then, well, so how did that even? So this is off topic, kind of. But how did that even work? Because I feel like today, you you everybody's on a dating app, and so they're they're swiping to meet people, and and I think that most people feel like if you're very forward, it's like way too much because yeah. they're because the the way that people interact now is so much more. There's a lot more time to like simmer because you you have so many different ways to meet people normally. So it's like, would you just walk up? I mean, so if you're at a disco bar, you just walk up and start talking to some random woman. And what, what would, how would this, how would that even work? Yeah. Well, um, some guys were better at it than others. And I was <laughs> never very good at it. So <laughs> didn't work all that well for me, but you know, generally, I mean, if you went to a disco bar or a dance bar, it, you know, the, the, the intro was, would you like to dance? You know? Oh yeah. And then you'd get dancing and then you could start talking. Cause I feel like today, if, if for some reason, you know, like if you went out to a bar now and you just walked up to some woman you didn't know, unless you had been dancing and had some kind of social proof that you were a good dancer and just said, Hey, would you like to dance? Someone would be like, I don't even know you. Yeah. Like, <laughs> why are you talking to me? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> like, yeah. Yeah. And, you know, I mean, you'd meet people if you went to the bar. People tend to be, particularly those who sit at the bar, tend to be more uh, socially outgoing. Mm. That's the nature of sitting at the bar. And that was how things worked then. But, uh, you know, you meet people at work, you meet people at the bowling league, you meet people at, uh, at uh, softball league, you know, that's how you met folks. So. Uh, just a different interaction. I should say also that uh, you, people can, if they're listening to the podcast, which you are because you're hearing me say this, uh, if you're if they can hear in the background some noise, we're actually recording this in my grandparent, the basement of my grandparents' house in Plymouth, Michigan, where you and mom are living right now. For uh, yeah, thanks for bringing that up. Uh, <laughs> that's a high mark in my life there. <laughs> Speaking of which, my mom just came downstairs. Hey, mom, can you can you grab me one of these from the fridge? <laughs> just ask my mother to go get me a, a, a beer from the fridge. <laughs> we need one of those little bells you can ring and <laughs> get service immediately. <laughs> hey, I like to complain about this basement. The service is bad down here. <laughs> anyway, so. Um, you know, oh, so man. to get back to topic a little bit. Uh, so after a year of, of hilarity, fun, and hijinks at the trailer, um, and there were a lot, a lot of fun things that went on there, but, uh, you know, it dawned on me that, hey, stamping cans and putting them on a shelf, that's how we, you know. And by the way, this is well before the UPC codes that appear on <laughs> items now. Yeah. Where you self-scan and you buy it and off you go. A cashier had to punch in each number and he hit it. And, you know, I mean, it was like, it was the Stone Age. It was the Stone Age. Yeah, exactly right. It was the Stone Age. Oh and we had gosh. to stamp cans or mark cans and packages with uh, the price tag on each package. Yeah. And, uh, you know, after doing that full time for a year, including working night shifts, by the way, um, you know, I just realized, hey, you know, I hate to say it, but, you know, they, um, I felt that they could probably train chimps to do this kind of work. <laughs> Maybe I ought to find something a little more intellectually engaging. So uh, back off to college I went. But in that year, you know, I had saved up enough money so that me paying for my own college was doable. And this is back in the time when that was doable. Well, so but, so but wait, let's, let's back up even more. So what was, was there a series of events that had you decide that you needed to go back to college i mean was there was there something that happened thanks mom 
<laughs> um, well, you know, I guess the, 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 the main thing, and I'm not knocking the guys that worked the night shift, but many of them were a year or two, a couple years older than me, maybe five years older, and, you know, uh, had a baby or two, you know, had a wife, and had kind of, and I think when I talk with them, their life's, their life process was similar, mm-hmm. and I could see that, you know, what had occurred was they disillusioned with college or school, found a job, started working, and then the rest of life kind of happened. Mm. And then they were trapped. You know, these guys are going to be working at the grocery store or similar kind of occupations the rest of their life because they now have a wife, they now have a baby, they have things and obligations that, that, that keep them in a way trap there mm. and I kind of recognize that as you know I'm not sure that's the track I want to head down and again I don't mean to sound you know bad about those who have chosen such a track or or by happenstance yeah. ended up in it but you know so that was a motivation that you know maybe it's time to get back to school so there was no kind of like moment that because um, I just find this interesting because it this mirrors slightly my I dropped out of school at one point not for a whole year but for a semester and um I guess I have I guess I have two thoughts that come to mind. The first is like in 1970. What was that? 70. That was probably 76. Do you think? Uh, yeah, probably was. Yeah. Because even in that time, you probably could have had a whole. If that was okay with you, meaning if you were fine working the night shift or whatever, you probably could have had a whole life, had a whole career doing that. And and your friend Eddie Stew in many ways has had a whole career doing yes, that exact right. thing. Yeah, exactly. So one of the three amigos, as I call us, the three guys that lived at that trailer. Because um, he worked and he, continued to work in the union, basically. Uh, yeah, pretty much, although he changed unions, he became a teamster and was um, a, a potato chip delivery guy and then a, a bread <laughs> delivery guy. That's nuts. And you'll be astounded to hear what they make. He makes six figures. It's insane to think about that. Six figures. Well, because he's been in it for 40 years, well, basically. Well, you know, that's part of it is longevity and what he was doing. But the other part is that, you know, that's the value, if you will, of the union that they ensure that their workers get you know, top wages. It's so. just nuts to think about. But like the the other thing I think is I, you know, I had, so I dropped out of college because I had switched schools and I had originally started at Eastern and then I switched and went to Grand Valley State University for one semester, which was like the worst semester of my life. <laughs> and, and wanted, I, I, I just hated that. I mean, this, it was a fine school. It just wasn't for me for a ton of reasons. Yeah, and, yeah. I dropped out. I didn't come back in the fall, and I kind of just was coasting. Like, I just didn't have any plan. But the reason I went back to school was because I was dating Liz Georgeoff, who basically was like, dude, if you don't have a plan, like, we're done. Yeah. And that scared me <laughs> into getting going back to school and getting serious. And then I went on and actually did very well at Eastern. Yeah, right. But... Uh, there was no moment. It sounds like you just kind of over time at being with these guys at the night shift were like, if I don't really take a proactive stance to doing something, uh, something is eventually just going to happen to me, and then I don't have any choices anymore. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you've summed it up pretty accurately. That that's pretty much it. So, you know, and and it takes a certain amount of discipline to make that change because. You know, the three amigos were having a ball. Yeah, and, I, well, that's and, the and problem. Is like, say, you know what? It's time for me to pull the plug and get out of this ball <laughs> and get on with life. Uh, because, you know, I think a, a lot of people, um, probably more guys than girls, wind up in that kind of mode where you're just, yeah, it's fun. It's it's you know, you're having a great time. And circumstances can then develop that keep you trapped there. And, and well, and uh, to be perfectly honest, also I feel like that was I, I when I was up in Manistee, and the the listeners will only know a little bit about this because I talk about it from t- from time to time. But when I was up in Manistee, I actively tried to. I although I did stuff, I tried to kind of not have fun because I made it worse for myself because I purposefully did not want to have any i was like this has to be uncomfortable or i'm gonna leave i'm not gonna leave yes and i don't want to do that i have to make this really bad for myself in order to ensure that i'm gonna move on 
Because I think I, I noticed that too. Like I had a lot of friends who hit a point that's good enough, kind of. And then they just sort of, they just don't, they're like, wow, this is great. And then they just kind of don't, that's just where they, they hit it and they kind of start coasting. Right. And uh, I, I, it's interesting that you kind of actively, because everything was going great otherwise. Yeah. Right. But, you know, if you hadn't have done that and gone back to school, you you would have ended up like, you know, Mike or Eddie Stewart, who are fine. There's yeah, nothing wrong yeah. with them. But you went on to have a very kind of unique and, and a career because and and had we were able to pull in a lot of people and affect a lot of things and a lot of sort of change. But that would have not happened if you hadn't had gone back to school, basically. Right. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, that would have not to mention things. you would not have met my mother. Yes, right. Yeah, so that's happened on the change back to school was in that first term met 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 your mom. So, so what? So you had gone back to school, but why did you? But you also moved into the dorms, right? Yeah. Well, I knew I had to get out of the trailer because I had, I had, uh, before I went back to school full time, decided well I can still work, live in the trailer, and I'll take a class or two a, a term. And, you know, it may take me a little longer, but I'm um, having so much fun in the trailer that I just don't want to give that up. <laughs> and after a term of that, I realized I'm going to get nowhere this way. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's a little difficult to uh, to crack open the chemistry book and start studying at 10 or 11 at night when your buddies are popping open beers and want to turn up the radio and you know, it's just not conducive. Although what I just described sounds like every college dorm room I've ever been in. Also, <laughs> <laughs> so you know. I think the only difference is that in the college dorm room, it, the their other people are also on deadline. Yeah. So when you say I can't tonight, people uh, actually listen to it. Yeah. Or or the option you got is. I'm going to stroll across campus to the library and study there while you guys are. Yeah, uh, good point. Playing the radio and drinking beer in the room. <laughs> so. Okay, so you went back to so you. Why did you go to Eastern Michigan then? Uh, well, actually, because um, they had a very good aquatic biology program. So yeah, a, a, after the engineering thing, I I uh, my thought on you know what do I really want to do, and I thought of you know it'd be great to be like a fisheries biologist with the Department of the Interior or with the Michigan Department of Natural Resources. And uh, so, you know, that was my objective was to do that. Uh, and um, or, or the other secondary spot was to be like a forest ranger with the Department of the yeah. Interior. You know, I thought, man, what a great job that would be. Be outdoors in nature all the time and getting paid for it. That's fantastic. And uh, so, you know, that was the and Eastern was close by and had a great program in that that focus. So that's why I went there. <laughs> OK, so you were talking about so you you went there basically just because you wanted to be a forest ranger. Yeah. So, well, that <laughs> or a fisheries biologist. So my major was aquatic biology and my minor was chemistry. So where did your, but let's, this, so this is interesting to me, and I think it might be interesting to listeners also, is that where did your, where did your interest in the outdoors come from? Because there's a, there's a pretty big swing from engineering to, yeah, and I mean like so, and then it kind of is interesting because it, it's not what you ended up doing, is you ended up doing something di adjacent to it, kind of. Yeah, well, that's one of the, you know, ways life has a way of working out. But, uh, you know, my interest in the outdoors came from acquiring a, um, I don't know, a pastime, if you will, ha hobby, you know, fun activity I did with some buddies, canoeing and camping, you know. And, yeah. And while I wasn't working or during summer vacations, you know, we did a lot of canoeing around the Midwest in some big rivers and a lot of famous rivers. And, uh you know, so that, that is where I got that big interest in doing that, you know. And so, um, you know, an offshoot of that was fishing and hunting and all that kind of stuff. But um, uh, so, you know, finding a job that allowed me to kind of do that all the time would be like just fantastic. Mm. You know, so that was the driver behind going back for that, that kind of curriculum. 
And, uh, you know, a circumstance has, so just as I was graduating and, and, and uh, applying for that kind of job with the Michigan Department of Natural Resources and the U.S. Department of Interior, the economy was taking a big slide, and, um, you know, there was a lot of initiative around, uh, you know, discrimination, anti-discrimination activities. So if you were a white male, your chances of getting into those places were slim. Really? Somewhere between slim and none. Oh, really? Yeah. And, and, and that, So did you have – so here's the interesting question because – I can I can believe that that's probably true, um, mm-hmm. but that's fascinating to me because did you do you have like direct evidence of like that? Did you ha- like did you apply to places and they were like, sorry, I can't hire you? And anybody be like, listen, guy, this isn't gonna work out. Or like, I'm just curious what how that ended up you how that ended up like presenting itself. Yeah, well, um, some of it is just you know what people would tell you, but when I went to apply. There were people that were, you know, told me that the scoring system uh. on the application included uh, if you were female, that was extra points. If you were a minority, that was extra points. So if you were a white male, you got zero extra points. Zero point zero. Zero point zero. Pretty much my <laughs> college uh, grade point average. Me and Mr. <laughs> Blutarski. <laughs> uh, anyway. Um, so, you know, that's, uh, so that opportunity wasn't going to happen, but I had met your mother. And so we went looking for a summertime job. This is before I graduated, by the way, um, between my junior and senior year. And we hit as many of the environmental type companies in the Ann Arbor area as we could. And there was the U.S. Geologic Survey and the, and the... So how did you do that? Did you literally, did you, when you say you hit them, what did you do? Well, you know, just essentially drive up, go in the door and with a typed up, <laughs> yeah. you know, single page resume, go, hey, I'm looking for a summer job. Here's my experiences. Here's my education. You know, you got any openings? And pretty much people were like, <laughs> well, no, we don't have any openings, but, you know, we'll yeah. take your resume. And knowing pretty much they probably threw it in the can the moment I left the door. But uh, so we hit those, you know, USGS and NOAA had an office there. And then there were, gosh, four or five environmental consulting groups in the area that we hit. And then as we were leaving town, and this is really the genesis of my whole career thereafter, as we were leaving town, um, uh, we were leaving Ann Arbor, heading north on North Main Street, and, and your mom noticed a sign on a building that said Environmental Dynamics. Um, so she said, oh, we ought to go in there. And I had run out of resumes. Oh, man. And I'm like, well, there's no point. Nobody's hiring. Everybody we see says no. You know, I don't even have a resume. You know, forget it. But, uh, she, you know, uh, she convinced me that it was worth stopping. So we turned around, came back, and I'm like, oh, this is going to be a waste of time. But I'm uh, fine. Okay, we're here. I'll walk in and ask. So I walked in. There was a receptionist there, and I just said, hey, here's I'm a student at Eastern, and I'm, you know, here's my curriculum. I'm, a, you know, environmental work, chemistry, aquatic biology, and I'm looking for a summer job, and, you know, I, if you have anything like that. And she grabbed my arm, and she said, don't go anywhere. Stay right <laughs> here. And I think you're exactly the guy we're looking for. And I'm like, lady, if you have any interest, I ain't going anywhere. <laughs> I'm going to stand right here. And she literally yeah. ran back to an office and then brought out the guy who then was going to become my boss, a guy by the name of Dave Dickinson. Um, and uh, Dave came up, and then he asked me a series of questions. Have you had limnology class? Yes, I've had lim- limnology. Have you done aquatic species identification yes i've done aquatic species identification have you done sampling do you know what a chemer sampler is do you know what a ponar dredge is have you used this have you used it and i you know had had done all that in I've, said, I've never heard any of these terms <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so uh you know he's like okay well um when can you start and i'm like uh tomorrow <laughs> <laughs> 
And uh, my recollection is this was like a Friday, and he goes, well, we won't be working on the weekend, but come in on Monday, and here's the application. Fill this out. And uh, then he looked at me and said, you know, I just want to tell you that the job is like minimum wage. And I'm like, I'll take whatever. I mean, if this is experience that I can have. And he said, so minimum wage, you know, that's at that time was like four and a quarter an hour by then. Yeah. Well, what year? This was what, 79? Yeah. 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 So it was around four and a quarter if it wasn't. A lot lot had changed in five years. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. The minimum wage had escalated pretty well. And and I was still working at the grocery store. So, you know, I was like, how is there a way to balance these two? And and I did it for a little while, but but after a while the grocery store just had to go cuz I couldn't fit in all the time working to both jobs, but yeah. Um so, you know, and uh that was the start of the career track because the work they were doing was work um associated with a corps of engineers who had a lot of environmental studies done before and during and after any time they had navigation projects which were mostly um harbors yeah and, but in, in the great lakes though there was a ton of navigation projects probably oh, and, yeah. and back in the 70s maybe not quite as much by 79 as my guess but probably through the 60s and 70s there probably were a bunch of 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 navigation projects. Yeah, well, that's absolutely right. And and uh, you know they were really building harbors and building um, water breakage and water um, protection zones, and and they were doing a lot of dredging of uh, shipping channels, particularly ports of entry. So any big city along the Michigan coastline, well, the Great Lakes coastline, anywhere uh, where big freighters might come up the river or at least into the harbor they would dredge those areas well and even in you know we don't think about this today but even in 79 there was probably a lot of great lake shipping that was still really going on it's probably not as big of an industry now but i think there was through the 60s and 70s there was probably a lot of great lake shipping that was still taking place container ships had only sort of been invented in the late 70s i think um, yeah, well, I think that's basically right. Um, there certainly was a lot of activity and a lot of construction work in the harbors and marinas. So um, this is I this is so different from the last podcast that I did because I was talking with Corey Moon about or Corey Wood, pardon me, about how he uh, almost <laughs> how he almost killed himself. <laughs> and now we're talking about Great Lake shipping in 1979. <laughs> Yeah, and the, you never know what you're going to get. By the way, happened back in the seventies. <laughs> what did say that again? Edmund Fitzgerald. That was yeah, that was that seventy. Uh, Lake Superior. What what year? Gosh, I want to say seventy three or four. Yeah, I mean, and it was a big. That was a big deal. Oh yeah, very big deal. Yeah. yeah so was... you ended up working. So this was QED, right? Yeah. Right. Exactly. QED. Um, which. The acronym stood for Quantitative Environmental D- D- Dynamics. Um, but QED is also from a Latin phrase, meaning that which can be de- demonstrated. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so Yeah, it's like qu- qu- qua ad- uh, adoria demonstratum or something. Something like that. <laughs> anyway. Anyway, uh, <laughs> point is that, you know, it was... It, it was a great segue into the rest of the group. I just, everybody so, listening to this podcast just got a real a real peek under the rug at how our family works. That we just tried to actually figure out what the Latin phrase QED. <laughs> and both guessing it completely wrong agreed that that was close enough. <laughs> close enough. Uh, let's move on. <laughs> <laughs> got it. Okay, great. We Anyway, we get it. <laughs> yeah, right. We get it. <laughs> Oh boy. Uh so QED was uh so the QED was basically you were so I've heard so this this is so interesting to me because I've heard this is who I think is this the company you met Dave Johnson on? This is the same one no, or no, is no, this no, no. Got it. All right, pardon me. Some on the, some other character from my a, father's a life that we will later. we will <laughs> leave out later. But anyway, uh 
so this the QED was you working on boats though a lot, right? Well, it did include that. Um, we did a lot of work for the Corps of Engineers, and the boat work included uh, working for the uh, Corps of Engineers. But we also did work for industrial companies because many environmental regulations were kicking in around that time. The EPA was issuing lots of regulations. Clean Water Act was getting aggressive. The hazardous waste rules were kicking in. Air emission rules were kicking in. So there was actually a lot of environmental work to be done at the industrial side of this. Mm. So my time was kind of split between doing Corps of Engineer work on the Great Lakes and sampling sewer water coming out of industrial plants. See, this is so interesting to me because that, so what the audience doesn't know is that that second part is where your career ended up kind of progressing. <laughs> the sampling the industrial of part, not sewage, sewers. sewage water. Yes. No, but like I, the core, it's fascinating to me, dad, because I, you know, knowing you understand that you're probably most interested in just being outside and yeah. on a boat right. and doing things. Right. And messing with sewage water is like a, I'll find, I'll find, fine, I have to do it, or something like that. <laughs> had to tolerate that to get to the good stuff, which was being on my, and so, you know, we did a lot of work with the Corps of Engineers, and, and we bought what we called a research vessel to do this great like, sampling, <laughs> and it looked a lot like the African Queen, um, <laughs> from, ran about like the African Queen. From the Queen. movie, the African yeah, Queen. Yeah, exactly, from the movie, the African Queen. We call it a research vessel, um, but <laughs> what uh, was its name? <laughs> I don't think it. Don't laugh, your daughter's on board. <laughs> so uh, <laughs> anyway, we. Uh, oh, that's great. <laughs> yeah, we we'd go out with uh, me and uh, Jim Rasmussen mostly, but I had a couple other uh, guys I worked with. But Jim was a college buddy, and uh, we. He would go out and do these projects. Oh, by the way, in this boat, which was uh, 28 feet, almost 30 feet long, it was a it was a seagoing lifeboat that someone converted into. They built a superstructure. They put in a, a two cylinder diesel firm and <laughs> engine, which uh, at full speed it would sound like. Bum, 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 bum. <laughs> you know, it's just unbelievable. Top speed. Somebody's playing a drum in the galley to get the yes, rowers exactly. to row. <laughs> That's exactly what it sounded like. And this thing would... Ramming speed. Yeah. Bum, 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 bum. <laughs> and top speed on this thing, by the way, was about eight knots, which is like 10 miles per hour. <laughs> so uh, sailboats would actually pass us on, on occasion. <laughs> I mean, it just took forever to get wherever you wanted to go. So, And it had this giant kind of homemade triple-axle trailer that we would haul this thing around from, uh, you know, we had, some, we had many a different ports around Michigan where we hauled this thing to and then would launch it and do our sampling work. And the sampling work was, you know, we'd have to get um, sonar dredge, or ponar dredges. And, what is uh, ponar? Well, ponar is kind of a name of a of a. It's like a, I don't know how to describe it, like a clamshell dredge that you would lower down. You'd cock this thing open so the clamshell is open. And then you would drop it. To and the... then you drop it down and it hit the bottom. And as you pull up on the rope, it would scoop up. It was like a giant, like one of those, uh, one of those. Yeah, uh, like are... like one of those games in the arcade <laughs> where you. Feed in hundreds of dollars trying to get that Cupid doll for your girlfriend, uh, and, and with about the same success, actually. Yeah. So uh, that's wait. So you would that. drop that to the bottom of the water to get to the brown, basically to the to the floor of the lake. Yes. To pick up whatever was down there to yeah, s- see yeah. what it was, what was yeah, there. Well, we were collecting sediment samples. Yeah. To be analyzed. Why would okay? So why would they be analyzed? Because this, if you were going to explain this to a business person, and if, if the EPA said you have to go do this before you do some industrial project, right? They would be like, "This sounds completely made up to me." <laughs> <laughs> well, the logic behind it was that. Um, <laughs> You know, these dredging activities uh, yeah. would uh, scoop up all of the bottom dirt, muck, sand, sediment on the bottom of a lake. 
and um, disturbed that to put a lot of that up into the water column as they scooped up all the mud and stuff. Got it. And and then it would redistribute and resettle. And so what they wanted to understand was how clean is this muck, if you will, because uh, you know this is back in the late seventies and early eighties and. A lot of pollution had taken place in the decades before that, the yeah. 50s and 60s. There yep. was very little regulation about industrial discharge into the Great Lakes. So, you know, you'd scoop up some mud and, and the mercury content could be very high. PCB content could be very high. So they, And all of these things, when, when then d- sort of uh, distributed or in like a diaspora into the water, mm-hmm. would be eaten and absorbed by fish and by wildlife and would just and swimmers and other people who would kind of just and uh, anything is a diaspora is that two aspras <laughs> or is that a bias that's a bias bro <laughs> okay. anyway oh there's some of that wet <laughs> yeah very little there's why why, why did you this is actually this is a real hold on this is a real question yes why did you not try to pursue a career as some kind of storyteller or some kind of because you had friends who were stand-up comedians and so one of the things that i'm famous for in chicago if which is really stretching the word fame to its breaking point uh is that everybody knows that i have uncles who have done stand-up comedy and who are like and people would be like, your uncle used to own that club in Detroit. And it would be like, yeah, he did own that club in Detroit. And they'd be like, well, how did he? How did you know him? And I'd be like, well, my dad was friends with him because he worked at Chatham. Yeah. Joe right. Blaska. Yep, yeah. And, yeah. Uh, and he, who I just saw, actually, uh, actually not just, but months ago, saw in uh, Chicago. He flew in and ha- was on a layover. Oh, really? Um, yeah. And I went out to Rosemont and did comedy, and then we went and grabbed dinner. Um. But anyway, he was a comedian for a long time, and he was a stand-up comic who actually started his own comedy club. But you were around a lot of comedians. You knew, t- you had met Tim Allen, and you had met yes. Dave Coulier, yes. and you had met because you used to hang out at Ridley's because that's where he was doing a bunch of stand-up. Was right. yeah. was Joe Belasco yeah. was doing stand-up at Ridley's, which was not in Royal Oak at the time. It was somewhere else, I think. Um, yes, that's right. In fact, he was in. Gosh, I think I want to say Bloomfield for a while. I forget or West Bloomfield. He it was up that way, and then he was in Farmington Hills. Uh huh. And but he was the only guy in the area doing open mic. So if you wanted to get up in front of people, that was the only way to do that's it. That's where you went. Yeah. And at first, it, you know, they wouldn't even have enough people for an open mic night. Like you could just show up and go on because. Yeah. He'd have maybe four or five people lined up, and that was it. Yeah. And that was, you know, 20, 30 minutes, maybe. Well, this was in 70, what, eight? Yeah, no, earlier than that. I think we were doing this in 75, 76. Well, in 75 and 76, Joe Belasco must have been like 20 at best. Yeah, probably. I mean, he worked at Chatham, and he had just gotten out of high school, too. And uh, same kind of deal with him, too. Yeah, he... So he was like my best buddy forever. And, uh, you know, we would just hang out all day most of the time. And this is, I was living at the trailer and he'd come over a lot and we yeah. just have a good time. But, uh, you know, I say, I say the same deal in the sense that after a while you go, you know what, I got to get on with my life. This uh, is, not, yeah. you know, so I think he had a big passion for flying and wanted to be a commercial pilot, which, which is what he is. Which yeah. is what which he, is, what he now. is now. So, but yeah. he still does stand up. He does shows in Dana Point, California, which is where he right. he lives and stuff. But how yeah. so so but why did you never want to do so he started doing stand up before the big boom even happened and right. he kind of yeah. rode part of it. My yeah. my my uncle Joe Blasco, who's not my real uncle, but um has just been always a close friend of my dad. But so he he but but why did you never decide to do stand up? Because you're you're known and everybody had, they said this at your retirement party. You're you're a great storyteller. Everybody knows you as a great storyteller. You have a great sense of timing, you know. Um, you know, you you uh you you know, you, you get up in front of people, but why why haven't you why didn't you go do stand up then? Well, because the nature of if you look at stand up comedy and, and, and the way it is handled in clubs now. Mm-hmm. Um, stand-up comedians get 
If you go to open mic night, you have what five minutes at best. Yeah, yeah, maybe three minutes, four minutes in Chicago. Yeah, mostly. so you're not going to tell a story. You're going to tell a series of one-liners. Yeah, pretty much. You know, they might be uh, more than one-liners. They might be five-liners, but you're not going to, you know, and you know my stories. And uh, yeah, they and they can be humorous, and they are humorous, <laughs> I think. But you know, it's not the kind of thing you whip one after another out. It's these these are stories. These are much more like. Mm. The Bill Cosby kind of comedy, yeah, um, y- you know, uh, where it's a story and you got to sit and listen for a while mm. to get through the story. So, so, you know, but wh- when I looked at how stand-up comedy was done, I'm like, I just it's not going to fit. You mm. know, mm. so no one's going to want to listen to my rubber burger story, or no one's going to want to <laughs> listen to my engine in the lake story or (laughs) no one's gonna want to listen to my crash noble gt in the ditch story because that story would be the whole time i did it'd be five minutes on stage for one punch five minutes for one joke yeah so it just wasn't but you never but but so but i'm not i don't want to let this go because i'm i feel like you know there's a lot of people who are like you just said bill cosby who do this kind of thing Mm. so but there was no you just didn't really have a desire to want to get in front of people and kind of develop any of this stuff because there's a lot of people who you know you could still have and i'm I'm not bringing this up as like some kind of criticism where i'm like why didn't you do this but i guess i'm curious because you were right next to it you know you and you would go you knew these guys like you knew Joe Belaska, you had met Tim Allen and Dave Coulier, and right. and jo- and Joe did this for a, a while. I, what year did he start doing it? Oh gosh, I should interview Maybe him. Seventy six. Yeah, I should interview him when he comes back to Chicago about yeah, about absolutely. this too. But yeah, I'm just crazy. curious because you knew because what's strange about this to me uh, a little bit, and maybe and I should let my listeners know this, all three or four of you, um, <laughs> is. I I started doing stand up because Uncle Mike McClure, your stepbrother, was doing stand up, and yes. I had done improv because I had an art teacher who had talked me into doing improv. Right. But then I had I remembered that Joe Belasco was a stand up comic, and ever since I was a little kid, I would say I want to be a stand up comedian. Yes. Which is weird. I, I now that I'm I'm remembering that, but. It's just fascinating to me because you had been. Well, your in- uncle Joe had a, a short run cable show for a while, and he interviewed you as the youngest com- comic, and you were like five, <laughs> maybe six. Yeah, yeah, height of my career. Yes, it's the most. Uh, and you had a joke to I've tell too. Actually, you had a joke to tell. Oh my god! I forget what it was, but it included Batman. <laughs> I think the joke was, why did why did Batman cross the road? And it was like, why? And he was like, because he wanted to climb a tree. Like, it had no, it was a total non sequitur. By the way, that joke crushes on the Chicago Blue Line comedy circuit now. Because that's it. those kinds of non sequiturs with references are exactly what the Chicago millennial looks for in comedy. Uh, so, I, I, we'll get back. I wanna, I'm going to get back to Great Lakes shipping in a second because, believe me, it is a riveting topic. But... I'm curious, like, what you, you didn't, you know, because a lot of this, you kind of became famous for, like, you know, making work fun and having funny presentations and, like, everybody else who you worked with all started doing these things, too. But I'm curious, like, why why, why did you not lean into that world? Did you ever try stand-up? Did you ever get up on stage at all? Uh, never. <laughs> <laughs> and I didn't really have a motivation to do it. Like I said, the context uh, and, the, and the format didn't mesh with my style of comedy, if you will. Sure. And, you know, I could tell there were, and, 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 you know, you go to enough stand-up comedy, open mic nights in particular, and you can see the person that has been, uh, you know, encouraged to get up there by their friends. Bob, you're funny as hell. Get up there. And then Bob gets up there, and nobody gets Bob's jokes, you know? <laughs> And, uh, you know, I just always had that envision, like, you know, okay, I'm funny with my friends. Yeah. Because they understand the context of what I'm talking about. But crowds who don't know me at all yeah. may not get anything out of this. So that's yeah. hilarious. <laughs> yeah. A and B, you know, the format in which my stories come out and what the time limit. So I have, here's so. the thing, Dad. I hear everything you're saying. And I just got to tell you, that's never stopped me. <laughs> 
and that's why we're having this kind of a podcast. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so, like, yeah, no, I, I actually, it's funny that you say that because I almost feel like I'm slightly the opposite in the sense that I actually mostly feel interpersonally that I'm, I'm actually not that funny. Like, like people, and and maybe I'm have a selective memory, but I have a lot of people who will say things like. Uh, or who, you know, I'll talk to somebody and I'll say I'm a comedian and they're like, Oh really? Like, what do you say? So what's a joke or say something funny or I, I don't see it or something. <laughs> yes. And I'm like, thanks a lot. Uh, one and two, um, I, I just, it just feels kind of like I, when I'm up in front of people in a crowd, there's a, uh, there's just a diff. I just, I get, I get that a little bit. There's the impersonality of it makes it a little bit almost easier mm. if that makes any sense. Yeah. Well, it can. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Back to Great Lake shipping. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, what a nice, what a wonderful tangent. <laughs> yes. So no. So anyway, that's very interesting because we should, we should, we could talk probably about some of the people who you, who you met through going to comedy shows over the years, but I think it's rather fascinating that you actually, you you knew, you had met these guys because they had gone through the comedy castle, and it was before right. the comedy boom, right. which took place kind of in the early 80s, right. is when like all that stuff started, started rising, and you knew Joe when he was doing that stuff, but you had you know career aspirations of uh of of working outdoors which totally makes sense because you're uh you know i just remember as a kid a lot you know we camped all the time right. and you're a guy who likes being outdoors right yeah yeah for sure so so anyway let's get back to so you're working at qed and you're doing uh ponar uh ponar dredges yeah uh, off the african queen <laughs> and, and and the other thing is we did um coring samples and when you core take sediment cores in the great lakes you know you're in 50 to 200 feet of water and you have a mm. thing that looks kind of like a rocket aimed down and you release it and it falls through the water and then embeds itself into the bottom sediments Did you ever accidentally like hit some crustaceans or some animals with this thing <laughs> Like uh, and he'd well, pull it up, yeah, and there'd be yeah, half we, of a fish sticking we, out the we side. We accidentally of it. hit mollusks on occasion. Really? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you know what a mollusk is? Yeah, it's or? like a it's like a clam kind of. Yeah, yeah, you got it. That's it. So, um, and you know those. those That's cl- the other thing that the Lemon family is good at. My dad would have loved to have explained what a mollusk was to me <laughs> because because I didn't know. Did you see? Uh, did you sense the fear in my voice as my brain? Went through its itself. Rolodex. I hope I get this right. Otherwise, <laughs> I'm going to have a 10-minute lecture on mollusk. <laughs> uh, yes. Anyway, um, you know, we'd, so we'd get those samples and, and haul them back. And we'd spend, we could spend two, three, four days out on the boat. And, um, you know. It, you would be on the boat for two or three days in the water? Yeah. Yeah. And the boat had, we had. Uh, and on a 28-foot boat, how many people were on the boat? Just me and Jim. That was just <laughs> two, just the, two of us. You two guys. Yeah, and we had at the time rather sophisticated equipment on there. We had a Loran C navigation unit, which uh, was the forerunner to like GPS. It used radio tower signals to locate where it was. Wow! And it was accurate to within a few hundred feet. Which in seventy nine is probably pretty amazing. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Pardon my dad as he takes a sip of scotch. Yeah, right. I, yeah, exactly. Um, so, uh, and then we had a, a real sophisticated recording sonar because, you know, when we do this work for the Corps of Engineers, we had to confirm that we were in the right sampling location to get the samples that we were collecting. And uh, so we used the the, the Loran C readings and the in the sonar printout to show what... Where, where they where you, you could yeah. prove that you were where they where yeah. they you needed to be yeah yeah so but uh, you know we had some unique experiences on that i remember one where we motored out of detroit and um into the western basin of lake erie and we had to go up past point Pelee in Pelee island to do some sampling which was actually in canadian water but the u.s dredged that shipping channel mm. so um you know and the storm came out of nowhere i mean it came across the lake in a hurry 
And we went from totally calm water to um, eight foot swells in a matter. Holy of, shit! Really? Yeah, we had barely enough time to get our equipment back in the boat, and then motored to the first port we could find, which is the little town of Colchester, Ontario. So you and, were you had crossed you were in Canada. You'd crossed yeah, we the lake. We were in Canadian water, and I was. That's the most frightened I've ever been because that boat was getting heaved everywhere. And, uh, you know, we, we just, we literally surfed on a crest of a big wave into the harbor. Jesus. And, uh, I, you know, I had Jim and I don our life vest cause I didn't think we were going to, you really didn't think I you really were going to make the it. The boat was going to get rolled over. Yeah. And so I remember as a kid being in boats sometimes with you where we had, so I knew that you had been in QED and done this stuff, but I, I remember having been in boats with you where we were in one time I remember Thunder Bay with uh Dave Johnson and somebody else who was dive go they were going diving. They wanted to go look at shipwrecks. Yeah, right. Yeah. Well that's Thunder Bay by the way. Thunder Bay in um Lake Huron, yeah, yeah, which yeah, is Yeah, yeah, not not Alpena. Thunder Bay, yeah, Ontario. Not, yeah, exactly. Yeah. So um good good point there for all of you. <laughs> I don't know how many people even thought about so any Thunder of your Bay. geography <laughs> majors yeah right <laughs> would like to want to make sure you're looking at the right place on the map yeah no but we were in thunder bay like Huron, and uh but that i remember there were there were there was a little bit of weather when we were on and i was like eight and i was terrified and i remember you being co- cool as a cucumber because it was probably like you've had this experience on <laughs> right. almost actually going on a floundering vessel <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <that's right. laughs> yeah yeah that would have been bad too because had the boat rolled we would have had a flare gun but we were far enough out i don't think anybody would have seen it you know wow and no cell phones no we had a marine radio but uh, uh it doesn't do much good if the boats t- you know yeah, toppled over down. yeah exactly so that's that's wild yeah so how long were you in Colchester then in on well, Ontario. Well, we got the boat parked. We, you know, the international law requires you call in and let them know you're a foreign vessel. So we did that. Then they wanted to know what kind of equipment we had. We had some rather unique equipment. So they that got a lot of attention, and they wanted to come right down and check us out. So they sent some officer uh, down to check our boat out, and uh, I think he was a little aghast at what he found. <laughs> Meaning like how? Yeah, uh, like, like, oh, you've got some pretty high-level uh, electronic equipment on this thing that looks like the African Queen. <laughs> <laughs> what the hell goes on in this But boat? because he was Canadian, he said sorry a bunch of times <laughs> and then politely excused himself. <laughs> he said a uh, many times, too, a, and we'd say ha huh, back, a, ha. Huh. <laughs> Huh, eh? Eh, huh? It was like a whole who's on first. <laughs> yeah. So anyway, um, and he stayed there so long that we couldn't make it to the brewer's outlet before they closed. So that was disappointing. <laughs> <laughs> That's actually pretty funny. <laughs> <laughs> For those who don't know. In Canada, you can only buy beer at a brewer's retail. You well, in Ont- in Ontario. Yeah. Well, I think I I maybe other parts of Canada. Is- no, it says provincial law. Oh, okay. Well, my experience has been this- wherever you are in Canada, <laughs> there's not a Seven Eleven around the corner. No, that's true. It's you got to go to the brewer's retail to buy beer, and then there's a <laughs> liquor dispenser someplace else. Oh man! Yeah, it's not uh, easy to acquire those mind-altering liquids. <laughs> okay, so we uh, you're getting tired, I can tell. Yeah. Uh, but we might have to do this in two parts, mm-hmm. and we'll do the second part maybe tomorrow morning or something. But um, the when I'm so so you were for QED for how long? Let's ra- let's oh, let's we know, can continue with this for a little yeah, bit. So but. QED, I was there from '79 to about 84-ish, mm. maybe 85. So about five or six years. Mm. And, um, you know, it was a great learning spot. And uh, You were there, were you, you were not minimum wage the whole time. Uh, no, actually the day before I got married in 1982, they bumped me up to a whopping 5.10 an hour. <laughs> 
above the minimum wage of four seventy five. So you were, but in eighty two, so you were there in seventy nine. You so, were there for three, and, and, and almost by the four way, years. To put this in context, <laughs> when I left working at the grocery store as a union job, I was making ten fifteen an hour. Oh my god! So I could go to work as a professional environmental person. For four seventy five, for less hour. than half of what you were making. Yeah, yeah. So this is nuts because I remember hearing that story from you years ago. Because you were, I, I remember, I don't remember exactly what I was dealing with in my college career slash to to working life transition. But you were like, you have to leave the job that you're that might you have to be, you could be doing something that's very lucrative, and you have to you might have to take a pay cut to get into the thing that you really want to do. And that might end up being more rewarding later on. Yeah. And, you know, it, and, and that uh, step, not to toot my own horn here, but takes a certain amount of courage and faith that mm. it's going to work. Mm. Because when you cut your income in half at the same moment that, you know, you're engaged and looking like you're going to get married and, you know, what all comes with that, to cut your income in half is kind of a scary proposition. And, but, when I looked at it, I'm going, you know, I can stamp cans and make okay money, but that's going to plateau pretty quickly. Mm. And if I go the other route, it may work better. And it actually ultimately works significantly better. But, you know, you know, that's a step you got to make with faith, I guess. I feel like that's a probably go- a good place to stop at at for the for here so this is part one. this will be part one if you're okay let's do part two tomorrow morning yeah All right. and we can uh and then uh we'll we'll talk probably for another hour or so and we'll we'll go through because even though there's a lot to do you got can labs asi right park davis warner lambert pfizer uh and we don't have to go in insane detail well, but um so one of the things is maybe it should be a three-parter because i have some of my funnier stories <laughs> relate to every place I've worked at. Yeah. And QED still has a couple of good stories. <laughs> <laughs> so you may want to hear these. All right, great. That's so, a good place. So it could be a three-parter. <laughs> All right, that's perfect. <laughs> All right. Well, we'll stop there. Thanks thanks so much, Dad. Uh, we'll, we'll, we'll get into the next one. Uh, for you audience members who are listening, we'll get into this one probably next uh, week. All righty. <laughs>